Hey, Scott Simbucci here, and it's time for installment number three of Startups Are Ultra Marathon. So uh, it's appropriate that I would make do installment number three because I'm less than three days away from the starting line. So the time I'm recording this uh, or uh, presenting this here on LinkedIn Live, it's uh, Wednesday afternoon. So if things are going well, three days from now, 72 hours from now, I'll be somewhere you know, heading down out of the high country after about 30 miles, um, heading into what they call the canyon. So uh, if you missed the first couple of installments, installment one, installment two, part one, part two, what I've been doing is sharing some lessons from the trail. So as I've been training for my next ultra marathon, which is in less than 72 hours, it's the Western States 100. It's one of the most prestigious and the oldest uh, ultra marathons out there in the world. And uh, so I've been training you know, I tell people I've been training since January 4th, but really I've been training for this race for probably the last seven years. Uh, just one, to, to get into the race, and two, to get myself mentally ready. And of course, the last six months has been really just about tuning up and, and getting ready for, for this this event coming up. So what I've been doing is uh, in these lessons from the trail, just sharing a couple of lessons that I've learned and discovered over the course of the last months and years in the in the work that I do in this training and doing these races and relating those back to ultra marathons because or relating those back to startups because really when you think about running your startup as much as we work in sprints and you're always pushing and you're always trying to get to the next release or the next sale or the next funding or the next hire everything feels like push 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 the long view of where you want to go from idea to impact is to really think about this as an ultra marathon and so the one thing that, that I would say is that at least with my races, there's a finishing line at some point. Um, you just, however many miles you cover, 100 miles, 200 miles, uh, at least at some point there's a finish line uh, for running a startup. Sometimes it doesn't ever feel like there is a finish line. There's always that next, you know, that next big checkpoint you get to that you think is like, oh, now we're done, is really just the starting line for the next part of your race. So uh, I try to keep this to about 20 or 30 minutes, share a couple of lessons. If you missed the first two parts, uh, definitely go back and check those out. Uh, we covered two lessons in each of those. So I've covered four lessons so far in the first two parts. I'll probably do two more today just to get these uh, documented and shared. And not sure if I'll get a chance to do a couple more before the race uh, in the next couple of days. But if not, I'll definitely pick up afterwards. Uh, so do make sure you go listen to those first two if you haven't already. But if you haven't, that's totally fine because uh, these aren't necessarily uh, built to uh, to build onto each other, you can you know treat these as, as modular if you like. So, uh, so let's dig in. Let's do this. And and by the way, you know if you're running a startup and you start thinking through as you're listening some of the the lessons here, and and you think about your sales and your growth and your idea to impact journey, if you feel like you want some help, then it could be something that the team and I here at Sales Quality can help you out with. So, uh, if you're keen to just have a quick chat, learn a little bit more, so we can learn more about your situation. Um, brainstorm, brainstorm some ideas, figure out if or how we can help you out, um, then by all means, you know, just shoot me an email, scott at salesqualia, Q-U-A-L-I-A.com, salesqualia.com. Or you can also just DM me if you're watching this or listening to this on LinkedIn, uh, or just leave a comment down below, uh, just put the word opportunity, and uh, we'll set up a time to have a chat. So, all right, so let's dig in. So, so lesson uh, number one today, which I think would be five, overall. And this is a, a lesson that I did a video about this actually a couple of years ago when I was training for another race. And it's a, sh a shorter kind of three or four minute video. So I wanted to include it here because it's very relevant to the training that I'd be doing this time around. And just my life uh, when I think about, you know, not just running the business, but also balancing being a dad, balancing being a husband, doing all the things I want to do outside of work and do those things well. Um, I think it's just an important lesson that, that I want to share. And that lesson is what I wrote down is no wasted miles, no wasted miles. So what does that mean? Well, it means that, that every workout that I do throughout the course of the week has a purpose. There's no wasted miles. I'm not just like running for the sake of running. So there's some, some of the runs that I do uh, are going to be long trail runs. I do those, as I mentioned in the past, a couple times a week. And certainly on Saturdays, doing very long trail runs, anywhere from 15 miles up to as long as 50 miles. And those long trail runs obviously have a purpose because they're designed to help me get out on the terrain, 
test my nutrition, test my fitness on the real environment in which I'm going to be racing, the climbing up and how do my legs feel and how fast can I go on the downhill without overshooting and, and burning myself out? Um, how do I pace myself over the course of a longer trail run? So those, those miles, of course, have a specific purpose. Even the shorter runs that I'm doing throughout the course of the week, you know, my coach will oftentimes have on the counter what he calls an easy recovery run of about an hour. So it's about a seven mile run. And sometimes I'll do those early in the morning. Sometimes I'll do those later in the afternoon. And those are designed to like literally recover from longer runs, but also add some miles. So it's lower miles, slower pace. And that's just designed to make sure that you're building up some endurance while not over like over burnt, like over uh, cooking yourself you can't do a 15 20 30 mile trail run every single day right you have to have some time to rest and recover so even those recovery runs have a purpose because now you're running but you're doing so on tired legs because maybe the day before or a couple days before you did a long trail run and that's just designed to, to keep your heart rate in check teach your body to, to be fat burning so your your metabolic rate is not so high your heart rate's not so high it's a nice slow pace teaches your body to burn fat as opposed to the quick burning carbohydrates. So those are examples of and uh, no wasted miles. That also means, you know, the metaphor of no wasted miles also means no wasted workouts. So, you know, there's some days where I'm doing two days, meaning I might do a run in the morning and then in the afternoon I'm doing some weightlifting or strength training. Uh, or I'll do some weightlifting and strength training on a Sunday morning and then that afternoon do a short run. Well, those workouts, those strength trainings, you know, sometimes is really short. They could be 20 or 30 minutes. And they're just body weight exercises in some cases. They're air squats and lunges and push ups and pull ups and uh, high knee uh, sit back lunges and runners at our best. These are all just different exercises that my coach has me do without any heavy weights. Again, they're, they're designed to help with flexibility, they're designed to help with mobility and strength and targeting really specific muscle groups like my glutes uh, for the step back lunges and the high knee holds. Uh, upper body strength with the push-ups, you know, actually doing push-ups in a certain way so that your elbows are close to your body. So it simulates kind of run as you're running and hiking, your arms are moving back and forth. And you need those arms as you're especially moving uphill in order to get some momentum. Right? You use your upper body to help pull along the lower body. So those have a specific purpose. And then there's other workouts where I'm doing that are heavy, heavy weights. You know, I'm doing deadlifts and strict presses and back squats and front squats. And those are designed to really toughen up my muscles give me like pure unadulterated power and strength. They also help strengthen my tendons, my ligaments, so that the pounding, you know, that you're feeling over like, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of steps. Uh, if you think about, you know, roughly six miles, seven miles is about 10,000 steps. You might have heard that from a, uh, someone in terms of fitness, like get your 10,000 steps in. That's about six miles. Uh, so if you translate that over 100 miles, right? That's hundreds of thousands of steps. So when you're doing that, especially around terrain that's downhill, so your body's really taking a beating when you're going downhill. When you're uphill, you're really pulling yourself up on top of rocks and roots and uh, really hiking hard. And you got to have strong ligaments and tendons. So those are all designed, again, to have a specific outcome in mind. Right? I'm, just, I'm not just running for the sake of running. So every workout matters. And it's even more important when I think about how to schedule my time, which is something I've talked about in previous, uh, in one of the previous installments, which is like, look, if I'm going to be out there for four hours or five hours, I'm going to make the most out of that time. Sometimes it's not about just pure distance. Sometimes it's, it's about what can I get out of that time that I'm out there running. So one, another running workout that I do is some speed work. So it's a seven mile run. And within those seven mile run, I'm doing 30 seconds fast and 30 seconds slow, 30 seconds fast, 30 seconds slow, or sometimes 60 minutes fast, 60, 60 seconds, excuse me, 60 seconds fast, 60, 60 seconds slow. That's designed to get your foot speed up a little bit, some, to build up some ATP in your muscles to help, help to uh, affect your ability to run a little bit faster when you need to run faster on some of the downhills and the flats out there. So again, they all have a purpose because I want to make the most out of the time that I have because every minute that I'm away, doing training, that means I'm not, I'm not home. I'm not helping my wife with my son. I'm not spending time with them. Um, and even the workouts that I'm doing, oftentimes, as I've talked about in a previous installment, I'm getting up at four in the morning or even 3.45 in the morning to get those done, get back home so that I can still participate in the daily routine that needs to happen every single day. So I don't want to waste any time. I don't want to waste any movements. I don't want to waste 
and emotion uh, doing workouts that just don't matter. So what does that mean for startups? What does that mean for sales? Well, I think a couple things is like a lot of times, especially as an early stage startup, uh, oftentimes one of the mistakes I see is founders and founding teams, they really focus too much on marketing and not enough, enough on selling. So the idea is like, well, we've got to, we've got to like build the brand and we've got to do ads and we've got to do SEO. We've got to figure out a way to get some organic and inbound leads. And all of those things are important. But at the end of the day, if you're an early stage startup, like that could, that could be a lot of wasted miles because if you're still early enough, you're trying to figure out product market fit, how can you possibly market if you don't even know what message and which market you're marketing to? And even if you bring in leads with your marketing, they might be the wrong leads because they're wrong fit people. They don't really match what is going to be your future ideal customer profile, your future ICP, right? So one of the mantras we talk about with our clients all the time is sell first, market later. Figure out how to sell your stuff. Figure out who your target market is. Figure out who the buyers are within those target customers. Figure out what all the process is. Why are they going to buy? What's the ROI they're going to see? What are the problems that they have? What are the priorities of those key managers that you're selling to? And how do you implement with those people? You got to figure out all of those things. And that's going to help you identify exactly what the message should be so that you can use that messaging in your marketing later on. So the wasted miles I see too often are miles of founders' time and effort and money spent on SEO and marketing and branding and going to conferences without a really clear sales strategy. Another example of, of avoiding the wasted miles is in your sales calls and in your sales opportunities themselves, there's this idea of continuations versus advances. Continuations versus advances. So this is a, a concept that I learned in Major Account Sales Strategy. It's a book by Neil Rackham. Some of you might recognize Neil Rackham as the author of Spin Selling, which is a, a very popular book out there in the, kind of the sales the sales world, uh, probably published 20, 30 years ago at this point, uh, he wrote another book called Major Account Sales Strategy. And what, in that book, he detailed the difference between a continuation and an advance. A continuation is when you follow up with a prospect and they say, hey, I'm not, I'm not ready to book a meeting or I'm not ready to make a decision, check back with me in two weeks. That's a continuation. You haven't made any progress in the sale versus an advance, which is maybe getting some kind of commitment saying, okay, I'm, uh, I commit to in the next two weeks, I'm going to send you a sample file or I'm going to have you talk with Bob over on IT in the meantime so that he, he can answer some of your tech or you can answer some of his technical questions. That's an actual advance because you're making progress towards a sale. And the idea of no waste in miles is in your sales call going in. Like are you ready? Are you prepared for that call to make sure that you're getting an advance, not just a continuation. Otherwise you in a sense wasted that call. You haven't made any progress, right? It's the same idea with this concept of just, just check it in. Uh, I did a sort of a rant on this about a month ago. This idea of like, can we just remove this idea of checking in on a, a prospect? Because just checking in doesn't add any value. That's a wasted effort by you. It's a wasted communication. It's wasted from the prospect standpoint because you haven't added any value. And it's wasted for you because you've kind of burned you know, a bullet in your holster, if you will. You've used some of that dry powder that you had. And instead of using that dry powder, instead of using that communication to move things forward or at least adding value in some way, it's just like, hey, checking in, which is actually annoying to a prospect as opposed to valuable. Um, going into every meeting, knowing what the outcome is. Like too often I see teams that, that go into a meeting without a really clear view of the outcome. Like have you done a huddle with your team, even if that team is you and your co-founder or you and your salesperson or you and your product person going into the meeting and say, okay, Going into this meeting, we're meeting with these people. This is where we were in the last couple of meetings. This is where we are now. This is where we want to go. And sitting down and saying like, an ideal outcome for the meeting is this, you know, which is getting a POC approved. Uh, if we can't get the ideal outcome, then the secondary outcome would be at least getting a meeting with Bob over in IT so we can talk through some of the technical integrations and, and some of the other technical questions that Bob and the team probably have. And if, if we can't get to that second, you know, second best outcome, what's the third best? Outcome. Well, maybe the third best outcome is we, we schedule a second demo with some of the people that we're missing from this meeting. So we, at least we have an opportunity to talk to everybody that's going to be involved with this decision. Right? Again, it's like no wasted miles. Every meeting has a purpose. Every meeting should have an outcome. And that's up to you. It's the responsibility and accountability that you should have to yourself to make sure you're making most out of that, that interaction. So um, you know, we had 
recently we had Todd Capone, uh, some of you might recognize his name. He wrote a best-selling book called The Transparency Sale. Uh, Todd's been a great friend and uh, a friend not just to me in the professional world, but also a friend to our, our coaching program at Startup Selling. We've had him come and do multiple presentations, multiple trainings. And something he said recently is that as you're going and focusing on a target market, like do that even if it's for six weeks. Like you've got to have a focus on a target market because if you don't have that focus, then a lot of that sales effort is going to be wasted. It's going to be exhausted. He had this quote, which he says, look, like every time you're out there selling, there's no science projects. We're not just doing things for fun. We're not doing things just to experiment. There needs to be an outcome for that. It's like, yeah, you need to run a sales experiment, maybe around a certain target market to figure out where you need to focus, or you need to run some experiments around your messaging or the people that you're talking to, but you're not doing it just to do it. There needs to be an outcome involved. And so I really love that quote of no science project. So uh, this idea of no wasted miles is just, it's just really taking personal responsibility in every sales call and every sales interaction, every sales opportunity and figuring out exactly what do we need to do in order to get the most out of that interaction, to get the most out of that opportunity. And further, more broadly, what are we doing to make sure that we have a focus on making sure we're selling, not just like marketing and branding, because those outcomes the marketing that you're doing could certainly be a lot of wasted miles. And so, so that's the first lesson um, for today. So the second one I want to share is uh, every detail. Cover every detail. So what does that mean? What does that mean for, for training? What does that mean for preparing for a race? So right now, a couple of days before the race begins, uh, I'm doing a lot of final preparation. I'm doing putting together aid bags that they have at certain stations where you can get stuff you might need uh, from an aid bag. I'm, I've uh, worked on a, uh, a manual for my crew, which is mostly my wife and my son, as well as two friends of mine that are going to be pacing me at certain parts of the races. And in that, in that pacer crew manual, it's a 14-page it's a document. I think the first eight pages are explaining to my pacers like how to pace me, what to expect. Um, these are my time goals. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the checkpoints along the way that we want to hit in certain times. Um, what to do in case of a medical situation. Like letting them know my medical history just in case something were to happen while I'm out there. So this is, you know, going through the entire, um, basically the whole, like visualizing how this is going to go. And I see my friend Dan at mile 62 in Forest Hill. And I'm like, hey, when I'm coming into the aid station, you guys should be able to track me from the last aid station, which is about a mile or is about an hour and a half away. So you should have a pretty good idea of when I'm going to be coming in. So when I come into the Forest Hill aid station, here's what I'd like. Uh, you're going to have this red bag and inside the red bag, there's this mix of tailwind and there's going to be an empty cup that I want you to fill with water and have that ready for me. So I can do a quick chug to make sure I'm staying hydrated. Uh, there's going to be a bag of plantain chips. I need to grab those. I'm going to want to switch, change my shirt. There's a red shirt in there. Like, like being super specific, not just showing up and them saying, hey, what do you need? Because that way I don't have to make a decision, which is something I talked about in the last installment, this idea of automating your decisions, just making everything preordained, pre predetermined. So you're not, I don't want to be coming into an aid station at 7, 8 o'clock at night after running 62 miles and have to make any decisions. I just want to show up. They're going to have the bag ready. Everything's open. Hand me stuff. Take my trash from my bag, fill up my bottles, and then let's keep moving down the trail. All of that stuff is in the pacer manual. In fact, I'll I'll include it, uh, a copy of it to the link just so you can see what I mean by cover every detail. Um, that also means like when I'm going through the race and thinking about every checkpoint, every aid station along the way, what's the distance, what's the terrain, how long did it take me to cover that terrain in training as I was working through, you know, I've, I've run 93 of the 100 miles of on this course already, uh, just in training this time. I've, I've done almost the whole course from end to end. There's only two miles of the course I haven't done. Um, it's just one one long hill, so I already know what to expect there. Uh, what I've done is I've calculated calories. I know exactly how many calories I need to consume per hour. I know how I'm going to consume that cal calories, how those calories are going to be consumed. It's like a certain amount of liquid uh, mixed in with some powder I use called Tailwind. I've got some plantain chips that I mentioned, maybe a goo gel from time to time, maybe some watermelon at an aid station, and making sure I don't I eat enough, but also not making sure I don't eat too much. Like covering every detail so I don't get any you know, gastrointestinal issues. Uh, how much water do I have to drink? And then how much sodium do I have to take to balance out the water? Because if you drink too much water without enough sodium, 
that's really bad for your body. And the same thing if you have too much salt without enough water, that's also really bad for your body. So I've, I've, I've mapped out station to station. How many calories am I going to be consuming and where are those calories going to come from? How to change out my water bottles. Uh, timing myself uh, from station to station. We did a, we did a 50 mile run uh, about four, three, four weeks ago uh, from mile 30 of the course down to mile roughly 78 of the course. So 48 miles, 48 miles. And they had, they had aid stations. This is organized by the race organizers um, just to help people see a lot of the course and get acclimated to what they're going to see out there. And they had aid stations. So I was timing myself through those aid stations as if it was a race. Okay. I'm coming in. I can see the tent. It's, you know, a couple hundred miles, a couple hundred yards away. Let me start getting my bottles unscrewed and out of my backpack. So then I'm not wasting time there. I have packets of tailwind in my side pouch. Okay, let me get my side pouch unzipped and get that packet out. What am I going to say to the people that are working the aid stations? Like, okay, I, I, you know, I just need some water and, and put dump this this packet in. Like, I'm rehearsing every single detail. Like, getting specific in the training. My coach told me, you know, the last couple of weeks in training, I was the, for two weeks midweek. I drove up to Olympic Village just to do some some work, some hill work in the elevation, as well as the first three miles of of the race because it's a long climb from it's about 2,500 feet of climbing in the first three and a half miles. And I said, Hey, is that a good idea? And he said, specificity always helps Like getting as specific as possible in your training, doing heat training. You know, it's been really hot out here in Sacramento Valley uh, the last couple of days, uh, last week or so. So I'm looking at the, at the, at the weather and going, wow, this is great. It's going to be in the nineties. It's going to be hundred degrees today. I can go do a run midday. And I was doing that with tights on and a long sleeve shirt. Because I wanted to get used to the heat, it's going to be 100 days, 100, 100 degrees or the, is the forecast um, that day of the race. So again, like covering every detail. I'm looking to take out the variables, right? I don't want to just like figure stuff out along the way. I want to know exactly what to do. I've gone so far, and this is going to really sound weird. I've gone so far as to practice not peeing. I'm going to, yeah, I practice not peeing. So what I mean by that is like, if you think about, if you have to stop to, to relieve yourself, right? It's like a minute, minute and a half, right? You got to pull over, do the, do your business and then move on. Well, if you, if you can hold, hold it for a little longer, you know, imagine in the road trip with your parents when you're a kid, you're like, yeah, I got to go. And they're like, oh, you got to hold it there's a certain value to being able to hold it, right? Because that means you're doing fewer stops along the way, right? Every minute is going to count. So like literally when I talk about covering every detail, I will literally in training practice holding it in, however painful it might be just to, you know, if I can do five less pit stops, that's five minutes. That's, you know, could be the difference between hitting my, my sub 24 hour time that I want to hit and or not, right? If I come in at 24 hours and three minutes, and I think to myself, geez, if I could have maybe stopped a couple less times, a couple fewer times, then maybe I would have made it. So this is the the level of detail. When I say cover every detail, uh, this is what it, what I go to in this final preparation. And and so what does that mean for sales? What does that mean for startups and sales? It means you can't skip steps in your sales process, right? You've got to think about you know what is my selling process and what is the buyer's 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 buying process. Like if I just let the buyer lead the buying process then is that going to get us to the finish line of the sale or the conversion of the sale? Probably not. You have to remember that most of your buyers have never bought a product like yours before. If you're a startup, they don't know how to buy your thing. They don't know how to buy your stuff, your platform, your software, because they probably never bought it before. It's not like office furniture. It's not like laptop computers where they have probably a checklist through procurement. It's like, hey, we have a new employee or hired 10 new people this week. We got to get 10 new laptops. It's like a checklist. It's easy to procure. They go get those laptops from, from Apple or Dell or whoever, right? When it comes to buying your software, when it comes to buying your platform, they don't have a checklist because you're probably replacing manual process or people, right? Spreadsheets or SharePoint. And so you've got to remember, you got to think about every detail about their buying process because chances are they're going to skip steps because they don't know what to do next. So it's your responsibility to look at your selling process and make sure that you're saying, hey, like I can't skip doing the qualification call the right way because I know everybody wants to see the cool new thing just because somebody wants to see a demo. I know I have to know that doesn't mean they're interested in buying. So that means I have to qualify that lead. Right? I need to do customer discovery. 
before, okay, I've qualified the lead, we set up the demo. It's the difference between qualifying the lead and discovering the real priorities, the real problems, the real pain, so that in the demo, you can make sure you're mapping your product to their problem, not just doing a Harvard tour, as my friend Peter Gaughan says, right? So these are examples of like covering every detail. It's some of what I just said a little bit earlier, going into a meeting. Are you preparing and saying, okay, what are the key outcomes that we want to get to? What's the ideal the ideal next step, the second ideal step, the third ideal step, if, if we have to have some fallback plans? What are going to be the next three steps that I'm going to propose to the prospect, right? How do you present your pricing? Like when you, before you're going in, you're going to review a proposal, you're going to review a contract with a prospect. Are you sitting down and like practicing that? Not just saying, oh, well, or objections, right? And they say, well, like if they ask about the price, I'll just tell them that, you know, the price is this. Like, no, what specifically are you going to say? Have you written it down and see how it sounds and tested it out on people that have never listened to you present your pricing before? So they can hear if it sounds, do you sound nervous, right? Do you, does it sound like it doesn't quite add up or does it make sense? Maybe you want to charge an implementation fee, but the way it's coming out doesn't make sense. And the prospect is like, well, why, why would I pay an implementation fee if I'm buying software? If you don't have an answer to that, if you haven't presented that the right way, then you haven't covered every detail, right? And I, I've also seen this with objection handling. Where, where, you know, I'll, I'll ask a, a client and say, hey, well, what do you do? Uh, what are you going to do in this, in this call if they ask you about integrations? They say, oh, I'll just tell them about the APIs. Okay. What specifically are you going to say? Well, I'll tell them we have some API documentation. I can send it over to them. Okay. Maybe that's okay. But like, what specifically are you going to explain, explain to them? Do they even really know what API documentation is? Because again, remember, chances are they've never bought your stuff, stuff like yours before, right? Or if they ask about support and customer success, oh, we'll just tell them, we'll just talk about our customer support. That's not enough to just say, I will tell them about this, or I'll tell them about that. Or we'll just we'll just share how we do this. Like you got to write this stuff down and practice it. You got to cover every detail. And when you cover every detail, that also means covering it with your prospect. You know, covering every detail detail of the proposal before you send it. Hey, you asked for the proposal. Happy to send it. Uh, I've drafted it up. I've got most of it done. I got a few quick questions. Let's review it first. Cover every detail just so that I know that you and I are on the same page, and then I'll be happy to make some adjustments and send it over. That's what I mean. Like when I talk about like I practice not peeing, you got to practice doing like what you're going to say when you get those objections and what are you going to do when they still object after you explain the situation? Like you got to cover every detail. You've got to be specific. You've got to get as real into the sale in your practice and in your preparation as if you were doing the sale. One of the things I used to do with my sales reps when I was managing at Altos Research is before, especially like bigger calls we were doing with some of the, we used to sell the financial market, um, the trading desk, like Morgan Stanley and TCW and Goldman Sachs. Those are all customers of ours. So we're selling, you know, 100K plus data deals. And one of the things we used to do before big meetings, we'd sit in the conference room and the whiteboard and we'd get a, get a marker and we would map out the call. Okay, if this, then that. And just do a big grid of, okay, if they do this, what are we going to do? Because if we want to get to this outcome over here at the end of the meeting and they want to take a right turn, how are we going to get them back? Where are we going to get the left turn to go back to where we want to go? We can't just wing it here. We can't just tell them this or hope for that. You got to cover every detail. So those are my two lessons from the trail for today is number one, no wasted miles. Number two, cover every detail. Uh, I feel like I've done that for sure (laughs) for the last six months and especially the last couple of days as I'm getting final prep ready. So with my 14 page runner manual, uh, crew manual and, uh, you know, counting every calorie to make sure I don't eat too little, too, too much. So, so that's it. Uh, so again, like, look, if you're, if you're going through your own ultra marathon with your journey, you know, you're going from idea to impact, it's a long journey and it's a struggle. You're trying to move up, right? You're trying to go from a basic idea with no customer, no revenue, up to a place where you're making true impact in your market for your customers. And that's going to feel like an ultra marathon. You know, it's going to, it's going to take you 10 years to get there. There's a famous Bill Bill Gates quote, right? Most people overestimate what they can do in one year, but underestimate what they can do in 10. Like that 10 years, that's your 10 year ultra marathon to 
go from idea to impact. So if you want some help with some of what I shared here, or just generally getting a look at your sales process to figure out what you've got to do to ramp it up, to scale it up, to get more repeatability, to get more scalability. Then like I said earlier, you know, there's a pretty good chance that a team and I here at Sales Quality can help. So um, if you want to get some help or you just want to have a quick chat to understand more about your situation, share a few details, work on a few ideas, and then figure out if or how we can help you, happy to do it. So again, send me an email, scott at salesqualia, Q-U-A-L-I-A dot com, scott at salesqualia.com. You just use the subject word private or opportunity, just something to let me know. If you want to have a quick chat, and Jocelyn will make sure that we get some time on the calendar. And uh, otherwise, you're welcome to shoot me a DM if you're watching this on LinkedIn, or uh, just comment down below with the word opportunity, and uh, make sure to get in touch. So, all right, so we're right at 30 minutes. I think that's a good place to stop. Um, might do one more before race day, but I'm getting pretty close. I'm not sure if I'll have a chance to do it. If not, we'll pick up after. And uh, hopefully, I'll, if I don't do one, before race time, then the next time that I do one of those, do one of these, I hope that uh, I can tell you that I finished with a time of 23, 59, 59 or better. So 24, that's the goal. All right, that's it for now. This is Scott Simbucci signing off.